Hey, welcome back. In our last video, I showed you how in Desmos you can come up with a lot of different uh, lines of best fit, curves of best fit for a set of data. Today I want to help you decide which of those models is appropriate, which one is uh, the right one. Uh, I'll have to tell you right now, there's not always the right one. Um, sometimes uh, there's some arguing. You can say, hey, I think this model is better because of this and, and so on. And, and so I wish I could tell you the magic pill that uh, will work to, uh, to make you to make that decision wisely, but there isn't one. There's a lot of different things you can consider. And so here's some of the different things uh, that I think you can uh, talk about when you're trying to decide which model's best. So uh, first is simply um, how strong of a correlation is your data? Um, we mentioned, uh, or you may have seen uh, in Desmos, that little R squared value comes up. Uh, put loosely, that's a, a good measure of how well the data points fit your equation. Uh, if it's one, it's a perfect fit. All the data points fit exactly on the line or curve. Uh, anything less than that's uh, imperfect. Uh, zero is, a, uh, is horrible. Uh, and so the closer that number is to one, the more mathematically uh, strong that fits. Uh, you can see this on a calculator as well, although it's not turned on by default. You might have to, to turn diagnostics on. Uh, I'm sure I can show you or your teacher can show you how to do that if you're interested in that. Um, anyway, that's one thing to consider, but not the only thing. Um, another really important thing to, to think about is what is the end behavior of your graph um, uh, of your model? Well, if you, if you try to fit it with a line, does that make sense with the data? Would your, sense, uh, would your data continue to grow forever? Uh, or for a quadratic, uh, quadratics are U-shapes. Does it make sense that something would go um, up in both directions if you keep going forward or down in both directions? Uh, and so on. Uh, I'm not going to describe every single one of these. So these are the different ones that my class uh, looks at. Um, I did forget one class. You might want to write down sine. That's a really common one. Um, how does a sine curve look as you keep going forever and ever? But anyway, consider the end behavior. Uh, another thing you ought to think about, and, and these are harder. You, you learn these kind of the more science classes you take and so forth, but uh, there's often some real world reasons why you might want to use one versus the other. For instance, uh, if you want to use a sine curve you know, to go up and down, there ought to be some reason to suspect periodic behavior, that something's going to happen over and over and over again. Um, a lot of models use sine curves. Uh, anything that has to do annually or yearly, uh, daily, monthly, um, if there are reasons to suspect that something should repeat itself every year or every day, um, well then certainly a sine curve makes sense. Um, or in general, if something's rotating, um, a lot of times a sine curve would make sense. It kind of keeps track of that. So something to consider. Um, another thing uh, to think about, exponential graphs are really common to model real world behavior. Um, uh, if you want to use an exponential, there ought to be some reason to suspect that how quickly something grows depends on how much you currently have. Um, populations uh, do that because, frankly, the more um, animals or people there are around, the more reproductions uh, can happen. So the quicker babies can be made and so forth. Um, financial problems tend to be that way as well. Um, the more money you have, the greater amount of interest you can earn. Um, a lot of chemistry problems uh, tend to work exponentially because the more of something you have, the faster that reaction can occur. So if, if there's reason to suspect that, then try an exponential graph. Um, a logistic curve is a, a nice one uh, for those who've never seen it before. It uh, starts off kind of flat and growing kind of like an exponential, and then it flattens out as time goes on and reaches a maximum amount. So logistic curve is a good one to think about if there's limiting resources. If you're running out of room or you're running out of space or you're running out of food, um, as such, they're really good for population growth or animal uh, populations, things like that. Um, a normal curve, you know, kind of the bell-shaped curve, um, it's a good one to use if there's some reason to think that there should be an average amount and that uh, there are, are kind of uh, little bits on either side tapering off, you know, some that uh, last a long time or that are really big and some that are uh, slower or, or smaller, but there's kind of an average amount. If, if that idea makes sense, then a normal curve might make sense. 
So anyway, those are some things to think about when you're choosing a type of model. Uh, one last thing is simply um, how practical is your model? How efficient is it? Um, you can always make a stronger correlating model if you add a few more terms. Uh, for instance, a quadratic is going to always fit slightly better than a linear. A cubic will fit better than a quadratic. A quartic, uh, x to the fourth polynomial, is going to fit better than a cubic no matter what. However, um, it's going to be a, a lot harder to work with. And um, if it doesn't give you that much better efficiency uh, or, or better accuracy and it's harder to work with, you might want to throw it out just for that reason. So um, this is part of a, a, a grand philosophy of things that, uh, um, in general, if you don't need more complexity, then, then don't have it. Um, so that principle is called Occam's Razor. Uh, you'll probably hear it in science classes in college and things like that too. Um, anyway, uh, in general, when we're working with polynomials, as I was mentioning, you can always get a better fit if you add another uh, power onto the end of it. But if that leading coefficient is um, a really small number, really close to zero, then it probably wasn't necessary. Um, anyway, how do, we, uh, how do we use these ideas um, in a given problem? Uh, let me show you. Um, if you want to follow along, you can click here and you'll see um, this file pop up again. But uh, this was the same thing we worked with yesterday um, or in our last video. I showed you the uh, data here for a projectile that was thrown up from the ground and then um, I'm assuming it would come back down because that's what projectiles typically do when we throw them. Um, and so we came up with a line of best fit and a quadratic of best fit, and a sine curve of best fit. I've added a few others. Uh, here's a cubic of best fit, uh, a exponential of best fit. Here's a normal graph of best fit. Um, and you could add more if you want. Um, so I'm not going to show all of these at once. But let's look at uh, just, first of all, the strength of the correlation. Um, some of these uh, are much better fits than others. Uh, the line, if you look uh, up here, line has an R squared value of 0.51. That doesn't, that's not very strong. Uh, and you can look at the data and the line doesn't look like it goes through the data very well. Um, as opposed to the quadratic. The quadratic has a much stronger X squared, or R squared value, 0.974. Um, and it looks like it goes through most of the data points, except for this guy right there. And uh, well, sine curve actually looks very similar um, and has a very similar R squared value. Uh, so those are both mathematically pretty good fits. Uh, notice the cubic, however, 0.992. So mathematically, that's a better fit than the quadratic. And if you look at that one, it is slightly closer to the majority of those dots. And so that, that might be one we have to consider. So anyway, um, I don't think we can need to consider this guy. It's uh, not a very good fit. Um, so I'm going to throw it out. And uh, the normal curve, uh, that looks like that. It's it's not horrible. I'm not going to throw it out yet, but um, I, I'm not leaning towards that one. The R squared value is only 87 compared to some of our 97s and, and 99s we saw. So anyway, the next uh, thing I would suggest we think about is what's the end behavior of our equations look like? So here's uh, the line, line of best fit. Um, this graph, if we kept going, it would predict that the projectile keeps growing and growing and growing. And that doesn't make sense. Projectiles don't keep going up in height. Uh, they come back down to earth. Everything I've ever thrown up into the air has come back down. And so I think we can throw out the line um, for two reasons. It doesn't have a very good fit, and it doesn't make sense. Uh, it predicts things that uh, aren't reasonable. So let's toss that one. Um, let's look at the, the two different polynomials we had. We had an x squared polynomial and an x cubed polynomial. And I might make the one a different color, the cubic. I'll make green maybe so we can see them differently. So the cubic is a mathematically better fit, but the idea of the end behavior is really where this one falls. Um, the green, uh, if you zoom out just a little bit, look, it predicts it's going to go way up into the future. That's not what happens when we throw something up into the air. So even though it's mathematically a better fit, it doesn't make sense. I'm going to throw it out for that reason. So, 
see them. Uh, let's look at the normal graph. Normal graph, um, uh, normal curve graph, looks like it goes up here. Um, it kind of has the right idea with end behavior. It, it slides down um, uh, and comes down to the ground, but this isn't what normally happens. It doesn't kind of slowly, gradually come down unless it was a uh, some sort of lunar lander with the rockets on the bottom or something that you know causes it to gradually stop or has a parachute maybe, but even that it wouldn't uh, slowly fade into the ground uh, at the end. So I don't think the normal be uh, normal graph uh, makes sense to use here. Sorry. So we're down to two. We've got a quadratic and a sine curve. Um, they look very similar. Um, I, if I zoom out far enough, and I mean like really far enough, you do see the sine curve eventually um, suggests that it's going to pop back up in the air again after uh, 100, almost 100 seconds. Uh, we know from experience that's not what happens with projectiles, but I don't like that argument either because the quadratic, this suggests that it's just going to keep going negative, negative into the ground. Uh, we know that doesn't happen either. You know, the ground stops it. So um, the truth is this, our model either way is um, going to not be true after a couple seconds. Once it hits the ground, we need a new model, something else that happens. So um, anyway, I, I don't know. Just looking at the two of these, uh, which would be better? Um, they both are really good. We could use Occam's razor on this and say, which of these would you rather work with? I mean, they're both... Um, for within uh, this many seconds, they're both really good predictors of uh, height and so forth, uh, basically the same. Um, and so maybe uh, I'd rather work with the quadratic because it's uh, uh, not trig. Um, or maybe I'd like to work with the trig because I don't have to pull out the quadratic formula then. Um, I don't know. We could make an argument either way. However, there is one reason, um, a real world reason, why um, we need to choose one of these over the other. If you studied any physics at all, uh, you know that projectile motion is governed not by a sine curve, but it's governed by a, a quadratic. I'll, I'll show you what that equation is. Uh, let me add a new one here, new expression. Uh, if you studied physics, you know that the position of an object is um, one half times gravity times times squared plus the initial velocity times time plus its initial position. So um, initial height, h0 maybe. So these are, uh, uh, that is the formula for what time, uh, the height of something. Um, people have studied that before. And so this is, this is not a sine curve. This is a quadratic. And if I were to adjust these instead of calling it h of t, if I wrote y1, and made the tilde, and then um, made instead of t, if we called it x1, because that's where our data is. Now we know that uh, um, we've got a good fit for all of these things. And I'm a little disappointed because uh, I, I would have suspected that this would have been closer to 32 um, in gravity uh, feet per second. So that's 32 feet per second, but it's probably made up data. In fact, I know it's made up data because I made it up myself. But anyway, um, here finally um, is a reason to choose one model versus the other. But had we not known that, um, could have gone probably either way with this. Um, so we made some predictions to, to see, hey, does one fit better than one the other? So anyway, I hope that helps you a little bit in deciding what model to use. Um, it's more a little bit more of an art than um, a science, uh, choosing which one it is. I guess technically it's a science because... Uh, it's something you could then explore. Um, I, I was trying to say it's not always a right answer um, right away um, until you, you try a model and, and you see if it works and you tweak it and so forth. That's that's the scientific method. So hope that helps. Um, as always, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, leave some in the comments or email me. And I uh, hope you have a wonderful day. Bye.